let's move on to the next talk. Uh, as you see, there really is quite a variety of different presentations. And <laughs> this next one is certainly going to be something very different again. Um, this is a talk by George Hathaway. And George Hathaway has a very interesting background. Uh, he's he is, is an electrical engineer from the University of Toronto. Uh, he's worked in a lot of different areas, uh, material science, pulse power, quantum optics, elect energy and propulsion, uh, and with a lot of different people. Uh, he is really uh, the Indiana Jones of uh, new energy research in the sense that he's this swashbuckler who's gone around testing different sorts of energy technologies from all sorts of places. Uh, he's one of the most fascinating people I know. You can sit and talk for hours uh, and he'll never repeat what he's uh, told you before about his, his, his energy research. Uh, today, he's going to be telling us a little bit about that. The title of his talk is Fundamental Issues in Energy Harvesting. So, George? Thank you. Let me share my screen. Everyone hear me, I presume? I hope so. Okay. Let's see, where is it? All right. Well, uh, welcome members of the Anti-Eddington League. I uh, appreciate the, uh, uh, once again, the, uh, uh, the honor to be uh, uh, amongst uh, all these uh, uh, forward thinkers and uh, um, folk who uh, have uh, been able to overcome uh, their uh, junior college or university uh, concerns about uh, um, second law and first law violations uh, and uh, uh, hoping to uh, proceed into the, uh, the, the next uh, realm of, uh, I guess it's number four in, uh, in Daniel's uh, um, uh, uh, chart of, uh, of historical uh, uh, movement towards uh, something that will help us as a species, uh, which we sorely need. And as uh, Jim Joszewski had uh, talked about earlier, um, uh, hopefully prevent uh, what uh, he calls a, 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 a dragon king uh, scenario. And uh, if we can convert some of these ideas into something uh, that is widespread, uh, wi widely available uh, and at uh, reasonable cost and uh, can be uh, installed as commercial devices, uh, then we are uh, uh, many steps along that road. And uh, as I mentioned in a, a previous talk, uh, my, uh, my goal is to off offer my services uh, at uh, Hathaway Research as sort of a uh, go-between or bridge between the, uh, um, the, the inventions that uh, we're seeing now uh, at this conference and in others uh, and the, uh, the, the commercial realm. And so uh, I've been concentrating uh, a lot uh, on in my past work on looking at uh, rather large scale effects. Uh, as I had mentioned earlier, um, the, uh, the, the issue uh, with a lot of investors uh, is, can I see something that I can put on the table or can I uh, build a plant uh, with? or uh, even I know make, make something as, uh, as I had uh, asked for, uh, discussed in a, in a previous uh, talk, can we make a coffee pot size something and have airflow through it and maybe a, 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 a catalytic converter of the, the type that uh, Daniel has talked about and have a couple of wires out and power your uh, uh, microwave or your, uh, perhaps your house. Anyway, um, those are the kinds of things that I have been uh, examining uh, over uh, quite a long time. And um, uh, Garrett was uh, kind enough uh, and maybe bold enough to uh, ask me whether I could uh, talk about a few of the uh, kinds of things that I've been investigating. Uh, 
uh, many of which you might know already from a thermodynamic standpoint, uh, some of which will be clearly uh, uh, capable of, uh, of, of analysis uh, thermodynamically and some not. And I will end the, uh, the talk as I usually do if I have time to uh, take a look at some of the uh, pitfalls and problems in the, uh, the measurement of the kinds of systems that uh, I've come across in the past. So uh, uh, the, we've all gone through uh, in, in great and uh, uh, delicious detail on this uh, conference and especially today, the uh, thermodynamic laws, uh, number one and two uh, in particular, and uh, we, I don't think uh, I need to, uh, to dwell on any of these in, in any great, at any great length. Um, the conservation of energy uh, is the, uh, generally the one that uh, uh, I have been asked to uh, um, pontificate, you might say, on for both investors and inventors uh, who claim that uh, a system that they uh, have worked on um, has uh, generates energy from nothing. Um, less, uh, uh, less activity has been uh, uh, expended on the, uh, the entropy end of things, uh, namely uh, the, the second law, the, the, the uh, uh, spontaneous heat flow law. Anyway, um, be that as it may, uh, we've gone through um, the various uh, easy types of, uh, uh, of analysis. And I think it was uh, uh, Daniel who mentioned that uh, he had uh, uh, come across, what is it, 21 different formulations of uh, thermodynamic laws, uh, perhaps the second law only, which is quite amazing. Um, from the engineering standpoint, uh, we have uh, steam engine type of, uh, of, of work producers using uh, the difference in heat between, or uh, difference in temperature, I should say, between uh, a hot reservoir and a cold. And uh, we also have um, refrigeration types uh, as you can see, I'm looking at this from an engineering standpoint, uh, where we can extract energy from a, uh, a cold reservoir uh, and, uh, and, and, and uh, dump it into a hot reservoir. One thing that uh, I haven't noticed in the, uh, the discussions so far is whether any uh, uh, analysis has been done or consideration thought uh, given to not only increasing, say, the heat or a heat flow to a hot reservoir, but removing heat uh, from a reservoir. Uh, all of the systems that uh, we've been talking about, or as far as I can recall, uh, talk about increasing heat or heat flow uh, from the hot reservoir back to the hot reservoir. Um, and I'd be interested to find out whether there are any ways of, of removing heat uh, spontaneously from, from a bath. Uh, and uh, given the fact that uh, uh, a lot of folk are, are, are concerned about uh, uh, global warming, uh, maybe uh, if we could uh, determine that uh, there's a way of, of uh, treating a, a cold bath as a, as a way of, uh, uh, as, a, as a reservoir that can be um, pumped into, namely, uh, or cold or heat removed from it, uh, that would be an interesting, uh, uh, different approach. So um, I think it was uh, Daniel also who mentioned the, uh, the, uh, the two uh, main uh, second law statements, the, the Kelvin Planck, uh, and I call it re reverse steam engine statement. Uh, and I bring this up as, as uh, this quote saying, it's impossible to make a cyclic device which receives heat uh, from a hot reservoir and produces work. Um, and uh, I, what is interesting to me is uh, the word cyclic and the, uh, the uh, comparison uh, between cyclic and spontaneous, uh, which uh, is a sort of a metaphysical uh, uh, distinction that uh, I, I've been wrestling with, um, which comes up in the uh, Clausius uh, and I call it the, say, the reverse refrigeration statement. Namely, it is impossible to make a cyclic 
device, which spontaneously, and you got those two words together, uh, without external work transfers heat uh, from a cold body to a, to a hot body. It's, according to Clausius, that's not the case. However, uh, it was shown, I can't remember if it was Boltzmann or uh, who it was that uh, uh, showed that these, these two statements are actually equivalent um, and uh, they constitute uh, a, a, what was considered an ironclad, at least to Eddington's view uh, um, and, and others uh, view that uh, uh, there's no way we're going to uh, circumvent uh, either the first or the second law. Um, however, I also have a, a question comes up um, with regard to uh, how, how we define heat and uh, and heat in the, in the context of uh, these, these statements, um, do they apply to systems, as I say at the bottom here, where heat is defined also to include random electromagnetic or, or EM-like fluctuations, for example, uh, zero-point fluctuations. So I, I, I bring that up uh, also uh, reminding uh, us that uh, Tom Ballone uh, initiated that, uh, I think, that idea that perhaps uh, some of our system boundaries should include um, a, a consideration of zero point fluctuations as uh, uh, I believe will be exemplified uh, with Garrett's pub, uh, uh, presentation after mine, um, which I hope I'll leave lots of time for. Um, uh, or uh, something like, uh, if you know uh, anything about uh, uh, low energy nuclear reactions, you you probably have come across the so-called widom larsen theory, uh, which uh, requires these magic surface plasma oscillations to suddenly bubble up uh, into a, a larger or a much higher energy state, which uh, allows the conversion of, uh, uh, of, of nucleons to, uh, to neutrons and, and uh, stimulates the low energy nuclear reactions in their view. Uh, would that also be considered heat? Um, and uh, there are a number of other areas that uh, uh, where the, the definition of heat in terms in thermodynamic terms is rather uh, fluid, uh, you might say, and it's hard to pin down. And and that usually allows an escape route for folk who claim that they are uh, violating or are adjusting the uh, the thermodynamics of their system. Uh, because uh, they are saying, well, we're not inducing heat. We're not worried about heat. We're talking about surface plasma oscillations or something like that. So uh, interesting uh, definitional issues from time to time. Uh, I've shared these screens before uh, <laughs> in terms of, of uh, excitement and uh, overexcitement and uh, uh, I'll, I'll zip through them. Here's, uh, for those who haven't seen it, my daughter um, uh, building something up from uh, bits and pieces or helping to build stuff up from, uh, from uh, an assembly of, of uh, components into a, a unified whole, which uh, you might consider as neg entropy or reverse entropy. And here's what happens when there's oh, too much stimulation, things just tend to uh, flatten out. Uh, into a, uh, a, a lower energy state um, uh, after, uh, after a day's, uh, day of hard work at the lab. Um, so uh, let's take a look at um, some of thermodynamic uh, issues uh, with regard to the ability to measure these things, at least at the scale that I've been involved with. And uh, as I say here, um, Generally, which I've been uh, mostly involved with the uh, first law, although this is a conference uh, today's mostly second law uh, issues, but uh, I will uh, um, concentrate a little bit on first law because uh, it's usually the most relevant at uh, I, what I call macro or uh, which is the cosmic scale or meso, which is say the, the lab scale. Um, uh, devices that, that I've been involved with mostly. And in uh, these kinds of systems, the, syst the, the boundaries, which are extremely important to, uh, to take into account, are much more easily defined uh, in general, I should say, and therefore uh, more straightforward to measure and determine the validity of the devices 
that are claiming to have uh, uh, circumvented or uh, completely negated uh, uh, the first law. Um, the second law uh, is more relevant in my understanding and uh, in my experience to more micro scale and nano scale energy interactions as we've been talking about uh, uh, Professor Lee talking about uh, um, uh, uh, protons uh, in, involved in ATP uh, activity and uh, uh, and, and uh, for instance uh, some of the uh, chemical reactions at, at uh, uh, catalytic uh, surfaces, as as uh, Daniel Sheehan has been talking about, uh, I call these uh, micro scale, um, and they're generally more difficult in terms of measurement uh, to set the system boundaries and 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 then and and measure. And as Garrett has asked uh, just a few moments ago uh, in uh, Professor Lee's uh, uh, biological discussions, are there any other uh, reactions that could take place uh, that might contribute to the heat um, that uh, the, the T term, the environmental term, perhaps uh, that would cause um, the uh, uh, the PMF to be as high as it is. And and I'm sure Professor Lee has uh, looked at all these and, and as as his uh, uh, answer um, clearly showed. But it it certainly uh, is required to think. Uh, outside the uh, constraints of the system that you're looking at uh, to see what other flows of energy uh, may uh, need to be accounted for, which is uh, fairly obvious, but I'll state it anyway. Um, so uh, typically, as I say, uh, uh, thermodynamic uh, law violations in, in my, uh, my understanding and the kinds of work that I've been doing um, result from several things, uh, most prevalent being faulty or incomplete measurements. And, uh, it, it, and I will come back to that uh, at the end of the talk um, when I go through my endless lists of uh, pitfalls and concerns um, about uh, how to measure systems, especially uh, in this case, energetic systems, whereas uh, my last talk uh, yesterday was uh, more in force uh, and, and gravitational or force measurement systems and measurements. In this case, uh, I'm talking about primarily energy and power uh, measurements. Um, and, and this is the, this is usually, uh, oh, actually 90, 90% uh, of the, uh, the claims that come my way uh, can be uh, put to rest by, uh, by pointing out the uh, inconsistencies or the incomplete uh, measurements or the incorrect application of uh, measuring instruments to the, the task at hand. Um, of course, uh, uh, I, I, as I say, I'm working more at the lab scale. Um, the uh, other kinds of measurements that we've seen in uh, uh, over previous days, including say atomic force microscopy, and, uh, and, and very tiny thermocouples and things of that nature. Um, uh, most of the folk on this, uh, uh, at this conference are pretty well versed in the uh, kinds of pitfalls and uh, concerns that might uh, uh, show themselves uh, to produce uh, prosaic explanations for what they're seeing. Uh, but in general, the kinds of uh, uh, devices that have come my way um, uh, have not had that kind of uh, very precise uh, analysis of, of the, the measurements required uh, to uh, verify the claims. Um, also, uh, incorrect system boundary definitions has been a, a great plague, uh, as was uh, emphasized before. Uh, God likes the crystals, or the devils like the devil likes uh, or the, the devils in the uh, uh, the interstices uh, of the intersection between. Uh, between these, the steady state, you might say, um, and without uh, making sure that you have well-defined uh, system boundaries, um, it's it's difficult to uh, make uh, solid predictions about uh, the time uh, uh, time progress of a particular system or the uh, the steady state uh, steady state claims, um, and of course there's. Uh, 
the energy inputs and outputs are there? Have they been uh, uh, consistently uh, analyzed and accounted for? Uh, and uh, a lot of times it turns out in the work that I've done, um, uh, some of or in, inventors say, well, the, my, the previous version of this device that, that I've improved on was shown to work. Therefore, mine must show, uh, mine must work. Um, so uh, I, I'm always uh, um, concerned about uh, uh, a, an inventor's reliance on, uh, on, on earlier versions of their device. And that happens with alarming regularity uh, in the, uh, you can see any, any number of these kinds of things on the internet, um, these, these energy claims. So uh, some of the, the micro scale uh, energy concepts, um, which I'll bring up, I'm only going to bring up two. Um, one that hasn't been discussed uh, at, at all in this, uh, this conference uh, is the uh, idea of Loschmidt uh, in the 19th century. I'll, I'll get into that in a bit. And uh, then I'll, I'll take a look at uh, Widom Larson in, in uh, um, a, a tiny bit of detail as well uh, as, as a theory for the claimed uh, energy production uh, from low energy nuclear reactions, or as it's uh, colloquially known, uh, cold fusion. And um, Lo Schmidt uh, here, uh, for those who aren't familiar with it, um, hypothesized, as you can read, that uh, a simple column of gas uh, in a gravitational field. So for instance, a, uh, a, a, a column uh, in, in a cylinder of, uh, of gas, like can be any kind of gas uh, that you can apply in Lo Schmidt's case, a uh, kinetic theory of gas too, which is not the case, uh, but a, a, a gas that doesn't uh, react um, with any other gases, a, a, a monoatomic or diatomic, but uh, a single gas in a gravitational field spontaneously becomes hotter at the bottom. Well, how could that possibly be? Well, he reasoned, as I say here, that any collision between molecules in that column, and, and a lot of those collisions would be vertically or uh, almost vertically, um, would on average send one molecule upwards, but as it goes up, it loses speed. Whereas those going downwards resulting from the collision would gain speed. And um, by the, using the kinetic theory of gases, um, those at the bottom would therefore be vibrating more, more quickly and be by definition hotter than those mo uh, gas molecules at the top of the column. So you could manage to construct a simple heat engine such as this one uh, from the, the, the Lo Schmidt uh, idea. And this, to me, the Lo Schmidt idea was an example of the simplest that I had come across before this conference uh, um, questioning of, uh, of, of uh, uh, the thermodynamic laws. And uh, this is a, a, a typical, um, picture of, uh, of Lo Schmidt's device. There it is, uh, the column of gas with the dots in it. And usually uh, most analysis, as I mentioned down at the bottom, omit the, the environmental temperature, the, the delta Q there, um, uh, going into the column. Um, they only consider uh, gravity uh, as the quote driving force. Uh, and you can see that uh, the, uh, the heat the heat flows in the column, uh, basically, or the, the differential in heat uh, is uh, between the uh, cold molecules uh, becoming um, hotter at the bottom. And if you connect the bottom to the top using uh, a heat engine, you could theoretically produce heat uh, from something. What is that something? Uh, if, uh, if the environmental temperature is removed, you put it in a very well insulated uh, container, this bottle of or this column of gas. The only other force you might say acting on this is gravity. Is this a gravitational heat engine? 
Well, um, it's a, a question that has vexed a number of people. Um, and uh, for example, Boltzmann uh, considered it, as I said, an intriguing idea, but incorrect uh, using uh, uh, velocity reversal and time reversal uh, uh, um, considerations, um, especially of mechanical processes. And uh, nowadays, the question of uh, the validity of the uh, kinetic theory of gas uh, brings into question um, Loschmidt's ideas. Um, and uh, it's uh, interesting that Boltzmann brought in time asymmetry uh, to uh, argue against a claimed violation. Uh, one thing I haven't uh, seen or heard in this, uh, in the conference is, uh, uh, at least in, in today's uh, activity, has been uh, uh, the influence of time. And I brought that up uh, with regard to the second law. I mean, an explanation or a, a, an explication of time symmetry uh, or time asymmetry in some of these uh, systems, uh, whether that would uh, um, go to, towards uh, questioning the, the validity of applying uh, thermodynamic considerations to some of these uh, ideas, uh, such as uh, uh, have been talked about, uh, uh, Paul Thibodeau's uh, and, and others. Um, and another uh, argument against Loschmidt, there have been quite a few, uh, have been uh, to do with uh, velocity distributions and, uh, and cutoffs and things like that. There are all sorts of them um, that uh, have uh, uh, suggested, well, Loschmidt's uh, out to lunch. There's no possible way that a gravitational field of being a conservative uh, field um, therefore can do no work. How could it do work on the system? Um, and uh, then another question is, if this is the case, is gravity actually producing uh, a, a neg entropy state, uh, a, a more ordered state um, in, in uh, providing uh, work, which is a or more ordered state out than the, this ensemble of uh, uh, gas molecules. Uh, well, oddly enough, uh, back, in, uh, back in 2002, uh, someone uh, published a paper saying, well, in fact, I've measured uh, a temperature gradient uh, <laughs> using uh, a Loschmidt type of uh, uh, assembly of, uh, of, of uh, a column of gas and in a well-insulated uh, container. So um, it's interesting that uh, someone's actually gone ahead and, and measured that. Uh, I haven't uh, looked into the details of it uh, uh, that much, but uh, um, to first order, uh, it looks like a reasonable experiment. Um, then uh, I ask uh, uh, whether there's any relationship between Loschmidt's idea and uh, what you're going to uh, hear from, from Garrett. Uh, and, and I bring up this uh, conservative uh, nature of a force uh, acting on a, a, an ensemble of moving particles, for instance, uh, and can gravity do, con as a conservative force, do any, as I say, sustained work on a system? Uh, but maybe can gravity act in the Loschmidt case as an asymmetric Maxwell demons? And we've uh, heard uh, from uh, previous speakers on the requirement for asymmetry in a number of these uh, systems um, that uh, apparently uh, that, that violate one or two of the, of the, the laws. Um, and can, uh, in the Loschmidt case, or a generalization of Loschmidt, uh, use gravity uh, as a, uh, as I say, segregating particle velocities and thus allowing a heat engine? Um, I have my doubts, but uh, it's, a, it's a question. Um, compare that to uh, what Garrett will be uh, talking about, is uh, asking whether, in fact, uh, zero-point fluctuations uh, can be considered a conservative force uh, and uh, therefore the lowest energy state, but the addition of a, an asymmetry, um, the, as you'll see the Casimir cavity uh, on one side of his device, therefore making it asymmetrical, 
provides the ne needed asymmetry to segregate zero point energy flow, you might say. Um, so th there may be a, a, an interesting correlation between those two ideas uh, resulting in uh, uh, perhaps a, a deeper understanding of what's going on uh, in some of these areas. Um, I'll go to uh, Eleonar now very, let's see, uh, to, uh, to just uh, do a, a specific uh, uh, example of, of um, how folk have concerned, have been concerned about uh, how any, any kind of uh, nuclear reactions at uh, room temperatures could possibly take place. Um, and I reminded of Heisinger's uh, uh, reality requirements for uh, uh, low energy nuclear reactions to take place. Um, uh, first and foremost, obviously, is how the Coulomb barrier could be possibly uh, circumvented um, by having these uh, the, the protons, uh, for instance, in, in a one view of LENR, um, um, overcome a, 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 a the Coulomb barrier between them and, and produce uh, other particles like neutrons. Um, and, uh, and if there are neutrons being produced, uh, where are the neutron emissions uh, in all, virtually all of the uh, uh, um, cold fusion results, uh, as well as uh, gamma uh, or X-rays uh, as a result of these uh, so-called or claimed fusion processes? Well, uh, two guys, uh, uh, Widom and Larson, uh, put together a theory that attempted to answer all these criticisms. By the way, there are other, um, there are other theories that uh, um, try to answer these, uh, these three criticisms. What I'm going to concentrate on uh, very briefly on, uh, on Widom and Larson, uh, only to bring up um, the, uh, the idea that uh, um, they had, they considered that, uh, as see, see in the next um, one of their papers. Um, and uh, I don't know that you can see my, uh, my uh, pointer here, but uh, it was shown that collective plasma oscillations on the surface of say a palladium uh, uh, piece of metal contribute some of their electric energy to an electron so that the following reactions become kinematically allowed. So the idea here was that um, by some uh, stochastic miracle, I guess, uh, surface plasma oscillations, which are, were, were really not well defined, um, could combine, uh, would, would nudge electrons to combine with protons and produce the neutrons. Um, unfortunately, there's never been a, uh, a, a, a reasonable, uh, thermodynamic analysis that I've seen of Widom and Larson. My own take is that um, uh, there's a, an entropic uh, problem here uh, with uh, what is the, how, how a um, uh, spontaneously uh, disorganized state, namely stochastically uh, uh, variation, variability in, in a background state of oscillations can suddenly combine perhaps like a rogue wave, as uh, as uh, Jim Jepsesky talked about earlier, into uh, an energy state that is high enough to propel electrons uh, into protons and produce the necessary neutrons. Um, I'm finding that uh, rather difficult to uh, to understand, at least. And uh, my question is: uh, Does uh, Widom Larson theory therefore violate? Uh, the, at least the Calvin Planck view. Um, however, there's been no definitive uh, uh, verification of uh, low energy nuclear reaction claims. And I'll now come out of theory a little bit and uh, look at experiments um, or commercial products after decades. Fons and Fleischmann are in uh, 1989. What have we seen since? Uh, we've seen uh, pronouncements that, oh, we've got something. Yes, the Spawar and others have, uh, at Navy have, have seen obvious traces of, uh, of uh, neutrons, therefore verifying this uh, uh, possibility that uh, um, thermodynamics uh, be gone. Uh, we've, we've got uh, low energy 
we've got nuclear reactions from a low energy source like uh, um, ambient heat uh, from, uh, in, a, in, a, in a low energy nuclear action um, experiment. Um, and uh, the, the, the latest thing was uh, the, the Navy attempted to revive interest that I mentioned in 2019 without much success. Um, the, uh, in my opinion, the most uh, advanced um, experimental uh, capability for uh, determining heat uh, transfer is the, what is uh, coll uh, colloquially known as the mother of all calorimeters or MOAC, uh, which was developed uh, at uh, Hal Putoff's Institute of Advanced Studies uh, around 2004-2005 uh, by uh, Scott Little, uh, the, the resident uh, uh, engineer and uh, thermodynamicist. Um, and uh, there's a diagram uh, that you can see of the complexity of this, uh, this device, which was specifically designed for looking at the validity and testing the validity of uh, low energy nuclear reactions. And you can see some of the, the features on the right. Uh, one I'd like to point out is uh, the, the third point there, the size, shape, and I say shape, temperature, and location within the chamber. You can see the heat exchanger, the calibration heater in the center, that's uh, in the cell is uh, sort of on the right of the center uh, right here. Um, just as, a, as a, an interesting point, a lot of uh, um, uh, calorimeters have been developed to show apparently energy gains in low energy nuclear reactions. But when you move the cell, or you, you move the sample uh, that you're uh, dousing with hydrogen from one place to another in the calorimeter, you get different readings. Uh, this is one of the only calorimeters where it doesn't matter where you put the sample with respect to thermocouples and and uh, and, and uh, conduction gas, uh, and uh, has very little effect on their measurements. And um, Scott has uh, looked at uh, uh, a, a bunch of uh, different kinds of energy devices uh, to show uh, to uh, at least 0.1 percent relative accuracy. There's no excess heat uh, in, in these, uh, these devices here, a couple of photos of it. You can see the size uh, uh, of it uh, relative to um, the lab. And uh, there's the, the main chamber inside the, that white box. It's uh, actively thermal insulated. So it's got active thermal insulation, uh, whereas uh, most other calorimeters are uh, passively insulated. Um, and uh, there's a, a cell, test cell inside that, uh, <clears throat> that test chamber. So uh, here's uh, some examples. Of, and, and those, I call the um, low energy nuclear reactions uh, uh, an ex example of, uh, of uh, micro scale uh, energy uh, activity uh, or concepts and inventions. Uh, there are tons of uh, uh, lab scale concepts, uh, many of which I've uh, uh, had the fortune or misfortune of, of examining, uh, which uh, have, uh, have issues, you might say, with uh, thermodynamic laws. Um, Randy Mills' uh, brilliant light or hydrino uh, device is, is one example I will uh, show um, presently. I talked about uh, Peter Grenot's uh, underwater arc explosions in a previous talk uh, yesterday. Um, as for fun, I'll bring up uh, a couple of others um, that uh, have to do with uh, um, solid state, you might say, no moving parts, uh, energy generation from nothing, basically, and then a rotary device uh, actually from Canada uh, in the short time. Let's see how we're doing. Yep. Um, Here's, uh, here's an announcement from uh, uh, the, the most recent uh, version of uh, Mill's um, brilliant light power. If you haven't uh, seen it already, it uh, started as uh, uh, Mills was, is a, uh, uh, a doctor, uh, a medical, uh, an MD who's uh, published a work uh, that uh, shows the masses, uh, was able to derive the masses of uh, fundamental particles um, in, in uh, several papers, which actually were 
pretty well received and peer reviewed. Uh, based on that understanding, he developed what he called a, um, uh, a low energy state of hydrogen. Uh, and uh, this low energy state of hydrogen called the uh, hydrino. Um, and, and this was years, years and years ago, uh, he, uh, he started this, uh, this path. And uh, um, as you can see uh, from this, if you can read it, um, uh, from a very humble beginning of uh, describing um, the development, the possibility of hydrinos, uh, we come up to dark matter and uh, unified matter and harnessing catalytically this uh, dark matter directly into uh, a, a, an energy device called the hydrino, uh, brilliant high energy light. Wow, look at all this, it's amazing. Um, and uh, with this uh, simple idea, he has uh, uh, gone on to uh, um, attract a, a quite a, a following as well as a lot of money uh, to develop uh, some of his, his uh, original ideas into what he claims is a, an energy production device. Uh, the basis of his claim is, uh, is shown in, the, uh, in, in this white uh, box on the right. Uh, and uh, basically, somehow, atomic hydrogen um, is, uh, reacts with a, with a catalyst. Uh, and by some means, energy is transferred from atomic hydrogen to the catalyst, um, which forms uh, an ion itself. Uh, and uh, this is, by the way, uh, directly from his, uh, uh, an early website uh, on, uh, on uh, what, uh, what, what a hydrino is. And uh, the, the negative, at least he's very kind enough to remind us that uh, an electron is a negative entity, uh, drops to a lower shell, uh, squeezes down um, closer to the proton. Thank you for telling us positive. Uh, to form a, a reduced size hydrogen atom uh, called hydrino. Uh, now there's already a thermodynamic concern here about what is the what is understood as a the uh, lowest energy state um, and uh, whether it's possible to actually reduce um, a, a, uh, an entity to a state with lower energy than the lowest energy uh, understand uh, the lowest energy state. Uh, and uh, I, I, I uh, question, uh, of course, this, uh, this claim um, that uh, why, by doing that, you release energy uh, in the form of heat, which uh, then can be uh, used to, uh, to, to uh, operate machinery and things like that. Uh, and then there's a, a cycling uh, this number three is uh, cycling this whole thing back uh, again, but uh, uh, with not only is the, um, um, the are the thermodynamics you might say of uh, going from a hydrogen atom to a lower energy state than than the lowest energy state a problem, uh, but then he says now if you add a lot of electricity uh, by means of uh, ionized. Uh, uh, or by, by uh, an arc, an electric arc, um, then the uh, space charge around the, uh, these ionized electrons is eliminated uh, and this uh, process, this reaction so-called becomes massively high. Um, and I ask a couple of questions based on this. Um, and just a reminder that Mill's atomic theory is based on, on classical uh, rather than quantum mechanics, and uh, it's been criticized uh, roundly by uh, uh, various people, including uh, Rathke in uh, 2005. Uh, anyway, uh, I, I'm not going to go through this but, uh, uh, in any detail, but uh, uh, some of Mill's supporters or claim that uh, they have done their own um, uh, tests on this and uh, uh, have come up with a, a confirmation of what Mills was saying. However, uh, I brought up at least 14 points uh, against or questions of, uh, on one of these uh, papers um, to uh, uh, 
to try to satisfy to my uh, in my understanding how uh, well or not well the uh, these analysis analyses have been done and they've in my opinion not been well done um, anyway here's a, a the most recent version of mills device uh, where uh, you have uh, these big uh, uh, electron uh, electrodes in here. You have the uh, hydrino formation on the catalyst uh, in this chamber. And uh, when you apply a very high voltage to from capacitors to this, uh, the electrodes in here, uh, a huge explosion takes place, sending a column of conducting material, in this case, uh, liquid silver through these, this MHD generator uh, and uh, cycling back and forth. And he claims that uh, uh, by means of the production of hydrinos in here, he can get excess energy well over, uh, above the uh, um, energy required to drive the whole system, including the capacitors to make the arcs and the, and the uh, pumps to pump the silver in and stuff like that. Anyway, here's the most recent version of it. And it's attracted a lot of attention, and uh, but no one seems to have uh, done much uh, analysis on the input energy side, which is the most difficult, namely the formation of arcs. Um, I will go and skip over uh, Peter Grenot's work, which I've, I talked about yesterday. Uh, that's Peter Grenot in the bottom right, and that's a junior version of me. Uh, and we're looking at one of his uh, um, water uh, fog experiments where he claimed that uh, the kinetic energy uh, produced by um, underwater electric explosions is greater than the, uh, uh, the energy required to provide the arc, uh, namely uh, to charge the capacitors, which are then discharged to provide an arc underwater. And uh, as I mentioned yesterday, uh, I uh, published a couple of papers with Peter um, attempting to show that uh, this was an energy producing device. Uh, it wasn't in violation actually of uh, first law because we uh, determined that the energy came from the sun uh, in, a, in a particular cyclic manner. But uh, uh, upon uh, re uh, analyzing exactly what, the, uh, the, what was going on in the arc, uh, we determined, I determined that uh, uh, the energetics were not as we had originally claimed. I had to retract that. Um, anyway, uh, that was a, a, a discussion of, of, of Peter Grenot's activity. Then we come to uh, a, a typical example, what you'll find on the internet of a, uh, a system that claims to produce energy from permanent magnets. In this case, there's a, uh, a permanent magnet here and a couple of coils. Uh, in a circular uh, loop and little coils uh, that are here change the flux from a permanent magnet from one side to the other, from one yoke, side of a yoke to the other through these pickup coils. And the claim is that the energy output from these pickup coils is greater than the energy uh, required to deflect the, uh, to deflect the flux. Um, and uh, this uh, claim, uh, Bearden, Tom Bearden wasn't the first to uh, develop this kind of device, but he's the most famous. Um, and as I say, the alternating flux generates a current uh, in, uh, in coils. Uh, claim was that the power used by the switching coils was less than the power output uh, in clear violation of the first law. And the proponents claimed that the permanent magnet actually was a source of power, uh, which slowly degrades over time. That's how they got around uh, claims uh, or concerns that uh, they're violating first law. And um, a permanent magnet, of course, is not a source of power. Uh, it produces a, uh, um, a conservative field, you might say, and it only degrades negligibly over time. Anyway, uh, to the from the uh, um, semi sublime to the ridiculous. Here's a uh, uh, a rotary device uh, which uh, claims to violate Lenz's law, and we haven't talked about uh, 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 first law uh, systems uh, in rotating 
uh, in a rotating configuration. But here's a, an example of someone who claims to be skirting Lenz's law. Here are permanent little bis permanent magnets on this rotor dri driven by this uh, motor, and uh, they they come across uh, and close to these pickup coils. And the claim is that uh, um, that uh, you can reduce the power driving the the, the drive motor um, if you get to the right uh, relationship between speed and uh, magnetic flux, and therefore uh, you can um, circumvent Lenz's law. And this is the inventor here, a, a Canadian fellow near Ottawa, Ontario, uh, who claims that uh, he can uh, produce uh, excess energy essentially by uh, skirting Lenz's law. Um, and he interprets his, he shows that the motor speed up uh, can occur when uh, his motor generator system is at a particular uh, apparently low energy state. And therefore he can gain energy from this speed up, which is not the case. Um, no increase in power violation of the first law. Um, in induction motor, uh, he just forgot that can operate in a range where torque actually decreases with speed. And um, anyway, we will uh, end this part with uh, uh, the consideration of Lenz's law as a magnetic version of the first law. Um, and uh, states that when a magnetic flux is increased through a closed loop, a current is induced that opposes the force. And if there's no opposition, um, no work can be performed. Um, and this is uh, uh, exemplified if there's no Lenz or Newtonian back reaction, the source of flux can change however it, uh, however it wants, but the coil does not absorb any uh, energy of motion. So. Um, a lot of systems that I've been investigated uh, claim to have subverted Lenz's law, uh, but uh, which is a, a version of the first law, but uh, clearly they don't. Um, so uh, the, I can get into in the last uh, couple of minutes um, the uh, uh, the issues uh, surrounding measurement, at least of the uh, kinds of systems that I've been involved with. Um, and, and why we need to why we need to measure. Look, taking a step back, um, we need to uh, uh, highlight, as I say, which factor, uh, which measurement issues uh, factor into the evaluation of uncertainty. It really is an approach to minimizing uncertainty that we're all trying to get to uh, in in uh, doing experiments of this kind. Um, and most of the the properties are quantitative in nature, uh, and they uh, resolve themselves eventually into uh, a, a decision, at least at my uh, end of things, where I'm trying to convince investors to, uh, uh, to help fund or uh, be interested in particular areas of uh, energy research. Uh, they have to make a decision, and they have to make a decision on the basis of uh, how, a comfort level in, in, um, in, in measuring the claims. And what I need to do is to reduce the uncertainty in uh, the kinds of uh, measurements that I'm, uh, that I'm doing uh, for both kinds of both investors and inventors. Um, and also, unless the methodology and results of a measurement can be transferred comprehensively, in other words, can I describe to you the results of a measurement uh, in terms that are comprehensible to you, uh, it won't make much of a difference. And the lessons I've learned, uh, some of them, consider all relevant explanations uh, to a particular problem. And uh, we've heard lots of those uh, in the conference so far. Uh, did you think of this? And what about that? And uh, please uh, give some thought to, to, to this possibility. And is it possible to design the simplest measurements and the simplest system that will validate or not the claims that are being made. Uh, don't keep adding more components and more complications uh, because, oh, we better check on this, better check on that. Let's design the simplest system, look at the boundary conditions and, uh, and, and um, make our decisions, uh, measurement decisions based on that. Uh, also ensure sufficient information is available 
Um, make sure you look at the history of the kinds of things you've been doing uh, so that you uh, can learn from what other mistakes others have made and always beware of confirmation bias. Uh, be concerned <laughs> when you think, gee, uh, I got a measurement, sorry, I have a theory and the theory predicts that this is going to happen. I set up a, an, ex uh, an experiment and I see this happen. Therefore, my theory is correct. Uh -uh. Um, that that uh, you gotta be really uh, careful of uh, falling into uh, uh, confirmation bias. Uh, uh, logical problems. And concentration, uh, obviously, on, uh, on claims backed up with a reasonable theory. Um, and uh, let me see how we're doing. I better stop fairly soon. I will uh, direct people's attention, uh, if they wish, to the second half of my nightmares in the art of measuring, uh, or as I say, what could possibly go wrong, Chief? Um, and uh, yesterday I talked about uh, the issues or some of the issues that uh, befall experimentalists uh, in, in uh, looking at forces. And I have this part um, of the presentation, uh, should I have the time, that examines uh, issues in uh, electrical power and energy, power and energy, power and energy, electromagnetic effects, et cetera. You can see all this as well. And uh, as an example, of the density of some of these, um, these issues. Uh, here are just some issues that I have come across um, just encapsulating and uh, encapsulated a couple of, uh, a couple of phrases uh, for uh, looking at uh, electrical energy and power measurements and the, the division of frequency. I do it by a division of frequency um, and uh, power in rotating systems, uh, what you have to be careful of um, Faraday cage issues, uh, which are not very well understood by a lot of people, at least those who have built cages and or enclosures and found, oh my God, it, it don't, doesn't work the way I expected. There's a leakage here. How come? I thought I'd just have to throw a bunch of copper together and everything would be fine. That's not the case. Anyway, lots of other issues that uh, we can talk about uh, offline if you wish. Um, or you can uh, uh, email me, I can send you this, or it will be, these kinds of things will be available uh, on, uh, in some kind of form or another uh, once uh, SSE gets a hold of it. Um, so you can see there's quite a bit of, of uh, quite a number of issues that need to be taken care of uh, before reasonable uh, analyses can be done. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, George. This, you know, you've, you've painted a, a broad canvas here and uh, there's, there's a lot for us to talk about. Um, unfortunately, there's no time for questions because we've run up to a full hour. And so there will be some discussion that we can have in about an hour. Uh, yes, that's fine. Thank you. Discussion. So let's take a one minute break and then we'll start the next session. Can I ask George about Pug Kleidenhoff? Uh, let's hold off uh, for, for an hour, okay? All right. Reluctantly, I will. <laughs>